Welcome to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take you for a look behind the ivory curtain, seeking a frank discussion of American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. My guest this week is Dr. Christian Brady. Dr. Christian Brady is the Dean of the Schreier Honors College at Penn State University. He's also an Associate Professor of Classics and Ancient Mediterranean Studies and Jewish Studies at Penn State. Dr. Brady, welcome to Inside Academia. Thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to talk to you today about... Uh, First, what it's like to be a dean, and what, it, what, what exactly is the mission and role of an honors college in places like Penn State, what I typically like to refer to as big box colleges. Uh, first, l let me just ask you a very direct question. You came here from Tulane University. Uh, you're probably one of the more younger deans that are out there in, in the collegiate world. Uh, what's it like to be a, a, a collegiate dean at Penn State University? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a very welcoming place. Um, just finishing my fifth year, it hardly feels like it, and uh, it is true. I'm a good bit younger than most of my colleagues here and elsewhere. I won't say how much younger, uh, but everybody has been incredibly welcoming. It is an incredibly collaborative place, Penn State. Uh, you might have to unpack for me your big box uh, descriptor at some point. Uh, but collaborative is, is the key word for honors programs and colleges. Um, we don't have faculty of our own uh, in nine times out of ten. And so all the courses that are offered, the things that we do are by collaboration, the, the goodwill and good graces of the departments and the faculty willing to offer their time. All right. And, and, and then uh, let's talk a little bit about the Honors College. In any given university where there is an, honor, an Honors College, it's typically characterized usually by small classes and interactive environments for students both within and outside of the classroom. Uh, at Penn State University, they all they live in the same residence hall, which is also common to many other schools, and they really have that that real classical sort of um, traditional university experience, where they get to uh, have bowl sessions with one another, and uh, they get to experience what it really is like to be in a colloquial style setting, which normally anymore isn't really common until you get to the graduate level. Many students in in universities these days seem to not have that experience unless they're in an honors college. So my question to you is, to what extent is that the case with respect to the Schreier Honors Program at Penn State? And how could that sort of experience be expanded for the rest of the students that aren't in that type of a, of a program? Well, I would say, first of all, um, most of our students at Penn State and other large universities do have smaller class size and opportunities. Um, it's not... Uh, as uh, the, the idea of several hundred person lectures and things, we, we certainly have them. There are only, however, uh, less than a dozen such courses at University Park uh, at Penn State for the entire university. So the, the image of a large, impersonal uh, college experience at a major university is not really one that's grounded terribly well in, uh, in reality. Um, our students do benefit from having smaller class sizes in their honors courses. There are no more than 24 students there. And they get a faculty advisor from day one, which is uh, important in terms of helping the students get a good sense from the faculty directly of the field that they're interested in going into. Uh, now, on the other hand, the staff advisors are actually the ones who often know uh, the details about meeting all your general education requirements and the ins and outs. And I admit, as a faculty member, we're often... Um, uh, unaware of, of some of some of those uh, more bureaucratic type of offerings, and so in fact, for us at the Schreier Honors College, we have good collaborative relationships between the uh, full-time staff advisors and our faculty, who are really in the role of a mentor. So, uh, with the Schreier Honors College at Penn State, I can state it short and succinctly. Uh, actually, we're in our recruitment session. We've made our offers to our students. We had over 2,900 applications for 300 spots this year. And the way we put it is that the Schreier Honors College provides you with the opportunity to have the best of both worlds. A top-notch research one institution that is Penn State, all the resources that come with it, major lab space, major grants, the programs you can be a part of, but the small, intimate, collegiate experience that you usually associate with a small liberal arts college. Uh, looking at the, the program academically, uh, if, as you may know, when you, when you typically go to a classical liberal arts college, the core curriculum from freshman year through senior year is very comprehensive and it's very structured in the sense that they start you out learning canonical things from day one all the way up until the very end of the, the very fourth year or the fifth year as, in, as it is in some cases. To what extent is there that sort of comprehensiveness for the honors student at a place like Penn State? Uh, 
Well, the honor students at Penn State don't take any um, uh, any different courses than the other students in terms of, of what is being offered. Um, there will be honors sections of the regular courses. Uh, Penn State University is actually fairly um, strong in terms of having a core curriculum offer, these general education requirements, whether you're an engineering student, science student, or a philosophy major, for example, in liberal arts, you still have those core gen eds that have to be taken. Um, there are very few honors programs, uh, and frankly, very few liberal arts colleges anymore, uh, that, that have a lockstep uh, curriculum all the way through. Uh, University of Texas Plan 2 is about the only one I know of uh, in terms of an honors program that has such a such a core course that everybody has to take. Okay, well the reason I, I ask is because I've interviewed a number of other people and uh, one of whom was uh, the, account, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know they have a, a website called whatwillthelearn.com in which they they looked at several universities, public universities, uh, state universities, and so on, and, and they, they identified about seven core areas of, of what they feel would be necessary for a college graduate, for a college graduate to achieve a level of proficiency in things like economics, U.S. history, and so on and so forth, mathematics, mm -hmm. composition, and literature, etc. cetera. And, uh, and most of the schools that they've looked at said that, that they usually, on average, have anywhere between two and five uh requirements met, meaning that they actually require their, their, their students to take a specific course in U.S. history, for example, or in mm -hmm. economics. Uh, at Penn State, they graded it as having three or four out of the seven. Uh, for example, there's, there's a U.S. cultures requirement, but not a U.S. history requirement. And then within that, you get to choose from many, many courses, some of which are sort of obscure or on the periphery. And uh, consequently, that leads to a student potentially graduating with huge gaps in their knowledge and not necessarily being proficient in either civics or, for example, in economics or core things that we would expect a college graduate to be, you know, a productive citizen and, and, and everything in the modern world to know. So I would imagine that a, an honor student would be the exception to that, would, would, would have some comprehensive degree of all of those areas. Can you, can you speak to that? Well, I can't speak specifically to this, uh, what will they learn? I don't know the, okay. the site. But, um, our, as I said, our honor students take the same, have the same expectations as a regular Penn State student. There's only one course we require from them, which is English 30, an honors version of English, and they all must do their thesis. I think the difficulty, Andy, is that there are lots of different constituents and groups out there saying, we know what is a core curriculum that students must know when they graduate. Uh, if you're an engineering student, there is uh, an accrediting body that says, here are the core things you need to know for engineering. If you're a business student, here are core things you need to know about business. In our own disciplines, within liberal arts, for example, um, in my field, we would say, okay, here are the things we believe you must know in Jewish studies. Right. Those are a lot of tensions pulling in a lot of different directions. Uh, I think the, the core general uh, education requirements that are required of our students at Penn State mean that uh, the vast majority of our students uh, graduate with a good, broad base of understanding with the opportunity to concentrate in the specific areas that they're most interested in. So basically you're saying that the, the, the course requirements are for pretty much the same. Students can take uh, from the same uh, pool of, of options as any other student. The only difference is, is that each and every honors labeled course is perhaps more accelerated and uh, is taught by a designated a professor that is understanding it to be an honors course. Correct. We All honors courses are taught by uh, tenured faculty uh, or on occasion some uh, distinguished guest visitors. Uh, those honors courses though, I will, I will add this, are not particularly accelerated per se. Uh, and they're not just harder for, for, for the sake of being harder. I'll give my own example. If I'm teaching Intro to Hebrew Bible, mm -hmm. ordinarily we'll have a textbook and we'll read the biblical text. There's a lot of material to get through, a couple thousand years worth of history there. When I'm doing an honors course, we'll look into secondary literature. We'll start reading what other scholars have said about the material. We might look at historical interpretation of texts, and the students will be asked to do some of their own critical thinking and writing to go along with that mm -hmm. uh, in that smaller class environment. Mathematics, for example, uh, honors math is much more theoretical uh, where, uh, as opposed to a more practical side of math. So those are the kind of distinctions, distinctions you get by discipline. Approximately how many uh, students are in the Shire Honors Program at Penn State? 
We have just under 1,700 students. We take in 300 students as first-year scholars coming in as, uh, as freshmen. Uh, then we also have the Gateway, where students can come in through their departments and uh, as early as their sophomore year, uh, but no later than uh, having four semesters, which unless you're architecture, that means you come in as a junior. And last year, we took in 365 students as Gateway scholars. Yeah, I wanted to ask you quickly a question about uh, social media. I understand you're a big advocate of the use of social media in the class community. Just quickly describe uh, what exactly you folks do in this modern age of all sure. this technology that we have today. Well, there there's sort of two categories. Uh, you mentioned in the class. I don't spend as much time in the classroom now as I'd like. In that context, we're using things like uh, uh, blogging for instead of submitting papers, our students are putting uh, submitting their writing in blogs and they're commenting on one another. We use such services as delicious tags to highlight articles and things so everybody can share them. In my administrative role, I have a Twitter account. I have a couple of blogs that I use. I do podcast interviews with alumni and distinguished visitors. Uh, and so we use all of that to, to push the media out there to speak directly to uh, our students and the parents of our students on the blog I posted recently about the budget situation and uh, what impact that that will or won't be having on the honors college programming. So I think it's very important. It's very reactive. Of course, Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. Not only do I have a personal account, but we have a college account and so on. Okay. And how interactive is this within each and every class for for the the honors classes in particular? It, it depends. You know, um, it, the College of Liberal Arts is it, there are an awful lot of faculty who are engaging in um, use of social media in the classroom. Uh, Christopher Long is our new associate dean uh, in the College of Liberal Arts and a professor of philosophy. It would be a great person for you to talk with about a number of your questions, including so use of social media. So the blogging platform is being used extensively. Podcasting. My brother, who has been teaching uh, supply chain uh, down at Harrisburg uh, Capital College in Harrisburg, makes has his students uh, do a podcast interview of a business leader in the area, mm -hmm. and that's one of their assignments. It's a collaborative project. It gets them engaging directly with uh, people in the field. Uh, so there's there's a lot that's going on around the university, and Penn State actually is doing very well. I'll note actually, I just got an email that uh, our world campus, Penn State's world campus, it was just announced today, was ranked number one in the nation. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let me ask you just one follow-up question to the social media. Previously, we interviewed uh, Mark Bauerlein, the author of uh, The Dumbest Generation, How Digital Media is Stupefying Young Americans. And uh, basically, his argument, his thesis in, in that book was to say that uh, so many young people, high school, early college aged, are using a lot of this social media and, and what he calls digital media, digital technology, but they're not engaging in intelligent media. Uh, they're, they're constantly, it's a 24-7 cycle nonstop of uh, texting and, and, you know, Facebooking and tweeting, but not necessarily engaging in intelligent topics with it. How do you see digital media in so far as an aid to college curriculum? Are people using it and embracing it to engage intelligent subjects outside of the classroom? Or is that digital trend more of a, a hindrance rather than an assistant, rather than a help to to the educational experience? I, I actually saw that you had that interview. I don't know his book. I can point to a couple others that would say the opposite. Uh, the, the question is: Were pen and paper a hindrance to learning in certain cultures? And there's actually a, a blogger who who drew this out. Uh, certain cultures where the focus was on memorization, wrote memorization, saw the use of writing materials, even fundamental pen and paper, as detrimental to learning and tradition. The printing press was, was roundly criticized. I see students engaging all the time in good, solid debate and discussion through the blogs, even through Twitter. Um, look at something like onwardstate.com mm -hmm. that was started by Penn Staters. There's a, there's a lot of great discussion that's, that's going on there and engagement. It is simply a tool. All of these things are simply tools. Some tools can be more distracting than others, um, but it is, it, they but themselves the are is, not inherently drawing right. down our, our students. Well, the question is, 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 are they using those tools uh, much to their intellectual enrichment more so than to their distraction? That's the question. In your assessment. Your right. And in, in my assessment is uh, no more or less than, than print media, right? Print media gives us Playboy. Sure. And it gives us the right. Society of Biblical Literature's journal. You right. know, it's, um, it, it's a choice that, that people make. And in general, uh, yeah, sure, if we're just sitting home in the week, we're, as likely to, we're more likely, most of us, to pick up the comics or the sports page than a philosophical treatise. Um, and so it is when we go on the web, we're, you know, an average person is as likely to 
while away time looking on Facebook as they are reading up on on uh, the exactly what's going on with the nuclear reactors in Japan. Right. But again, the, these are mere tools; they're neutral. And so I, I think to say that say that social media is dumbing down our this generation um, is a fallacy. It's it, they're just tools. Okay. Well, I'd like to talk to you further about this uh, on another occasion, Dr. Brady, but we're out of time. So I want to thank you again, Dr. Christian Brady of the Penn State Schreier Honors College. Thank you for joining us today. This has been Inside Academia with Andy Nash. Check this out again on the web at InsideAcademia.tv. Please join us again next week as every week as we take you for a look behind the Ivory Curtain.